other women, happen to be women, who are doing this work. Um, my interest in eco-theater dates from the 1980s when I wrote Better People, a play that critiqued in satiric form the then current, now failed mechanistic fascination with genetic engineering as a cure for all disease. Um, Better People was about scientists with views across the spectrum of genetic research, and I interviewed many of them. The play includes the, the presence of a rare yak who speaks one word, rendezvous. Rather than be cloned, she swallows Dr. Edward Creo, who George played all those years ago, who emerges as an ecologist from the belly of the beast. Um, also in the 80s, I created a series of ecology and theater courses at NYU, and I adapted Krista Wolf's ecofeminist novel, Cassandra, for students, writing choral passages of peaceful and ecological desires for students to sing and dance. Um, I think there's no difference between a, a ecological concern and a concern for peace. They're connected, right? All my plays include the natural world, the oil, the oil soaked birds in going to Iraq, the fate of the bees, the, the super, the forest, and the sea provides to the refugee woman and the beekeeper keeper's daughter, the soldier's idol on the beach in prophecy. Um, but when I returned full on to science in 2012, it was to confront the reality of climate change. In my play, Extreme Weather, which is spelled, um, yeah, we're going to some slides of the production. Uh, it's spelled W-H-E-T-H-E-R, um, weather. Uh, I am again using current research, not only about the science of global warming and climate change, which in and of itself is enough to stand one's hair on end, but about the ways in which that science has been censored and is being willfully misunderstood by the so-called climate change deniers of those with financial ties to coal, coal oil, and natural gas industries. This well-funded campaign against scientific truth, which we hear in the Republican campaign that's going on now, the critiques of the Pope. Uh, you see it on your television in those ads that talk about clean energy through fracking and millions of jobs. This is all funded by the fossil fuel industry. It's all a campaign, much more we can say about this, uh, of disinformation. Um, th this well-funded campaign against scientific truth may well prove the most consequential blockade of human knowledge in history. And this is what my play is about. The play is based on the life and work of American scientists, most particularly James Hansen, Michael Mann, and Jennifer Francis, plus the research of biologist Tyrone Hayes into the effects of the herbicide atrazine. All four have been attacked and vilified for their groundbreaking research. Um, I came to view climate scientists as visionaries and altruists, flawed and flummoxed like all such people, who are suddenly called by forces outside themselves to excel themselves. In other words, their science made them have to speak, right? Um, fighting not just their own reluctance to become publicly involved and their own ill adaption to public and activist lives, but ultimately fighting for the truth in the face of falsehood. Not just because truth matters in some abstract or even moral terms, but because the fate of the earth itself and all who live here is, is obviously at stake. I set the play as a family drama because we are an American family, broken again by the events in Charleston, as we've been broken so many times, as we're broken by this feud about climate science, but still somehow a, fam a family, dysfunctional and broken. But, uh, what happens to the least of us, a frog in this case, is likely to happen to us all. Extreme Weather, whose title is a pun that is also a dare, is built on pairs and opposites. The scientists John and Rebecca struggle with the implications of their knowledge. One supports and encourages the other, and the, when the other loses strength or hope. The publicist and lobbyist Jean, who is John's twin sister, and Frank, her husband, plot and plan their misinformation campaign and the exploitation of the family land. And the wise old environmentalist uncle and young motherless, motherless intersex Annie bond across generations and through a shared commitment to protect Earth and Earth's creatures. Throughout the play, I'm also juxtaposing styles of what might be called psychological and magical realism. In extreme weather, I want people to re-experience those moments of absolute wonder, utter peace,
and sudden insight we have all experienced alone in the natural world. Through the oracular voices of Uncle and Annie and the juxtaposition of lyric and realist stylistic modes, I try to create a poetry of the theater that frees the imagination and allows us quite literally to come to our senses. Um, so that's the reading. Now, uh, George Bartenyuk is going to talk about how we present these plays uh, in what format. I mean, we present them as plays, but then we do something else. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, Th this, this theme has been my favorite theme since I was uh, in kindergarten because I went to an incredible school where they taught you by using nature as the model for everything. And that included uh, dramatizing uh, all of the holidays as uh, plays, uh, as, as drama, and we all dressed up in costumes and enacted all the uh, various rituals that, that, that are present in those holidays that celebrate the changes of seasons and the death and the rebirthing of life. So to me, this has been uh, my obsession in many ways uh, for over the years, and I keep coming back to it for this simple reason. We are now in a world crisis, and many years ago, uh, somebody said to Sean O'Casey, the playwright, uh, what do you think of the atomic bomb? And he said, oh, it's a wonderful thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, what? And they were shocked and horrified. He said, oh, no, it's going to bring us all together. Well, <laughs> to some degree, uh, it did. Uh, and we managed to uh, pull Reagan back uh, from the uh, uh, swashbuckling uh, Oval Office. Uh, and then he met with Gorbachev. And then, uh, you know, it, it was possible uh, to... Uh, uh, slow down and slowly stop the Vietnam War. Well, now we, we are in the issue for the first time uh, universally that, that really, really, really uh, has all the other social justice issues in it. It is embedded. Every single, if you really think about it, every single other social justice uh, uh, issue is in the environmental uh, uh, issue. And I, I Okay, what it is, because it's all respect for the other, for the other person, the other creature, the other plant, the other rock. And you know, Indians say that rocks dream. So everything is alive and to me sacred. So uh, this is what we do. Uh, because the, 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 the urgency of the issue has grown to such a degree, um, we have added another dimension to our productions. And uh, that has come about very naturally because I even in the beginning when, when we didn't do this, um, uh, uh, Karen, who always does incredible homework so that the plays are filled with the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the information you need to understand what the problem is, but also the imagination so that you can feel <coughs> it and feel your own uh, 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 feelings about that issue. And this is a very important kind of uh, dimension in because we believe in the art first. First is the art. You must, you must really believe in what you are doing so that it affects people, so that it works. Because that's I, I, my definition of good art and bad art is if it works, it's good art. If it doesn't work, it's bad art. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you, you really have to uh, pay attention to that first. Then when people are opened up, you can start having other people come in and start saying, what do you think? And, and, and now, you know, I'm going to tell you a few things that I know because I've been out in the field trying to do something about it, and, and, and I'm an expert in this particular focus of the issue and this particular focus, and that's what we do. So every performance, we have somebody, uh, and those two scientists that she mentioned, they came to see your early readings of the play, and that's what you have to do. You have to engage the people and the people that, that, that you're writing about, the communities that you're writing about, engage them from the very beginning before the project is even finished. 
You want to say because then they can do a little. Uh, 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 so they can make some suggestions. Sure, they, time. Yeah. Okay. So anyway. Uh, 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 but yes, the festival, of, <laughs> uh, the festival of conscience is the way that we do it, so that the play goes into another dimension uh, when it when it gets to the the, the speaking. The, we call it the festival of conscience, and we have all these people from different, uh, you know. Uh, so the audience really dialogues and even argues. And, so and on, so. now it is my great pleasure <laughs> to introduce tonight's speaker, Dale. Jameson, who has written a, He's a very powerful book, Reason in a Dark Time, Mr. Jameson. Thank you. Well, I, first I just want to say what an honor it is, it is to be here. This is such a powerful play. The second thing I want to say, which I think the play does an excellent job uh, of bringing out, is the relationship between science and policy is extremely complex. Um, John often seems to have a rather naive I idea that uh, all I have to do is do my science, tell the world about it, and everyone's going to go, right. Right, I'm going to change my behavior. That's the way it is. Science tells us what we ought to do. Science doesn't tell us what we ought to do. Tell us, science tells us how the world is. And science tells us how the world will be, probabilistically, on certain pathways. But science doesn't give us the oughts. It doesn't tell us what we ought to do. It doesn't tell us how we want, how we, how we ought to live, and it doesn't tell us what kind of world we ought to be leaving our children and our grandchildren. There's always that gap between what the science can do and what we have to do. And I think the play does an excellent job of showing how much space there, there is in that gap. And that is one of the key problems with climate change that science is at its most authoritative when it is describing the world. When the scientist moves away from the laboratory and starts telling us how to live, they're now in the world of politicians, of priests, of bartenders, and your mother. They're just another person telling us what we ought to do. The third point I want to bring, bring out which I think is also really excellent in this play and quite unusual, I think, when artists try to confront issues like climate change. You know, when you think about climate change, often the focus is just on this world we're making, you know, how catastrophic it is and all of that. All of that's true. But, but what we often tend to lose sight of is that life is really built up out of moments and encounters with other people, with other creatures, with nature, with cities, with places we love and places we hate. And in some ways, the fundamental challenge of climate change, you know, isn't to save the polar ice caps or to save the polar bear. Those, those are important challenges. But the fundamental challenge is to how to find meaning in a world that is undergoing this rapid change. And so I very much like the character of Uncle, for example, because in a way, Uncle would be Uncle and living his life whether climate change was happening or not. Uncle is somebody who is all about forging meaning in the life that he's living in the world. Okay, George will do a little Uncle. So, we shall surround our pond with rosemary. Time and England time. Partridge pea. Blue eyed grass. A thicket of sassafras. Low shrub blueberry bushes. The red flower called cosmos. And most 
miraculous of all. This scruffy little wildflower, Tories mountain mint, endangered the world wide. Imperiled yet amazement on my face. Here it is, to see, to sniff. Sometimes I do despair. Why not? Not with you, my dear. No, not in front of you, I tell myself. Forgive me, child. Care of this land was passed to me by your grandfather, a noble soul, like your papa and Tamina. Uncle, he said. They called me uncle even then, though I had no one. I was sublimely unattached, had wandered by and struck by the beauty of the view, and stopped to linger here. You shall be the steward of my land. As far as the eye can see, we shall hold in perpetuity. Should any of my progeny wish to dwell in this domain, you, uncle, will see the land comes to no harm. No one shall disrupt the mountain top, the mountain stream, or bubbling brook. Your grandfather spoke like that. In those days, nature intervened in all our words. We painted with our tongues. We kept the land forever in our thoughts. We walked with beauty inside and out. And now we bend down and marvel at a sprig of Tory's mountain mint. We have our miracles still, small though they are. Once we walked the world and we were minuscule. Old growth forest. Above our head, a cacophony of creatures. We sensed our place in the grand design to marvel at the large and small. The sky, the mountain, the honeybee, the plant beneath our feet, not to step lightly, not to leave a mark where we had walked. The grasses would rebound, the forest would remain untouched. We would harvest and replace. We would exit as we'd come. Unremarked upon. Um, this is, uh, these are two short. I hope they can get this to uh, a broader audience because it makes a lot of valid points. And it does it in a more entertaining way than usually this subject, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, uh, the documentaries are just not very interesting. Uh -huh. And so it's hard to reach the public. Maybe if this would, uh, maybe this could take off and reach a bigger audience. But what do you think was the most like poignant part of the play um, as far as reaching people about how important this topic is? Well, I think it's actually the love of nature. Uh -huh. the, the, the girl, um, rather than the ice, you know. The <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but it was, you know, it's a combination of all these different characters bringing in um, with the, uh, the, there's quite a bit of realism in the way the fracking and everything is brought in uh, and on the other hand what it's competing against and you have to have a love of nature or it's hard to um, be concerned about the problem on the short run because the big big biggest problems in this are things that will happen over the time scale of decades and centuries when the ice sheets run out of control we can't say how rapid that's going to be although it's looking more and more rapid as we see what's happening uh, around antarctica but uh, we are messing with a, a system which is <laughs> please shake your hand real quick as one of the media <laughs> huh? played him shaking his hand but i'm going to fast forward here to jennifer francis who's the other uh scientist whose work i used in this play uh a wonderful arctic ice scientist let me just sorry i can't shoot up because i didn't get the right 
There she is. Yeah, I'm trying to get the flu and we're going to start. It's a little out of focus. Though. Yeah, well, that's. Yeah. <coughs> and I think that comes through very strongly in this play because a lot of what you heard tonight, which I don't know about you, but I am absolutely exhausted. Yeah, right. <laughs> You've been through <laughs> um, again. So much of it is true. Yeah. Um, and the complexity of these many aspects of the climate system and people and energy and politics mm -hmm. and the ecosystem and all of these very complex parts of our society that she wove together in this play in just, I thought, a masterful way. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of truth to it, and that's because she did her homework so well. Um, it's, it's just a very impressive play, and I just wish the audience were 50 times bigger. And we do too. I just want to thank you all for coming and being so interested uh, for whatever reason. Um, you know, this is, this is a very important message that Karen is, is bringing to the public in a way that I think um, will reach many people. I mean, as, as, it, as you heard in the play, it's hard sometimes for scientists to, to connect with the public. Um, you know, some people obviously get it, but some people just don't. And so this is a venue and a and a way of communication that I think is extremely important because this message is extremely important. And we've got to just try every way we can. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think we formed such a bond mm -hmm. so quickly through our phone calls. And then I came down here about a year ago, yeah, I think, for yeah. an, an early reading of the play. And I must say it's improved. <laughs> it was great yeah. then, but it was even yeah. better yeah. tonight. Yeah. And. Um, I just want to thank you, Karen, for doing this amazing work. So thank you. Let's, yeah. So we need the lights. You've uh, heard of Sniffley's demise. What, that door? That door cannot be fixed. It slams at your box time. I look ridiculous. I am wearing the skins of the deer you killed. I stitched them for years. Some ewes must be weighed of waste. We've neglected to eat her meat. Some screws and a new spring. I shall put it on my list. But however, let me provide you with fair warning. I fix what needs fixing. First, I am standing perpendicular to the good earth for but a flash not to be wasted on mundane tasks. Sniffley's loss serves to remind us how fleeting life is. So Sniffley lived long and well. He left a pond populated by his descendants. He uh, had friends across species. He served by devouring his fair share of insects. Solar, wind, and wave, these alone last forever, sufficient unto our needs, and those who remain after Soon as Sniffly has been mourned, I shall return to my last great project upon the hill. Yes, John, great project, I tell you. I shall not be moved. I saw surveyors up there in hard hats with Frank, but it is a little matter. I, John, am constructing a wind turbine farm on the northwest corner. Not only this small domain, but that whole town below will be able to survive on nature's endless bounty alone, a beacon to all. The, 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 the solar panels on the roof were the cause of my last lameness, and the wind turbines on the hill will be the source of my death, but the wind will blow for eons and eons. Eternity will be here on earth where it belongs. Actually, no, if it's okay. Um, you know, the, the, the ways we deal with climate change artist, uh, artistically have to do with the many ways it's going to impact our 
society, and we were talking about you know, the, the, the state of becoming refugees, and because we all will be in some sense, because we're, turning, we're taking our own planet away from ourselves. So, Leilani, do you just want to talk a few minutes about your work? Sure. And um, then if, you, if universities want to talk a couple minutes about their work, that would be great. And then I'll sure. do Sure. Um, well, my company is called Tita Productions. Feel free to get one of these cards. Why don't you come up here? Oh, sure. Oh, yes, because HowlRound is right there. Oh, so. hey, HowlRound. Okay. <laughs> Actually, can you put up my web page, Ben? Why don't you? I'll try yeah. to cut me yeah. off. That's our web page right down there. Okay. Um, so we're based in uh, Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Over the last uh, 10 years, we've been working with the Laotian refugee community in the United States. And um, if you, you may or may not know, it is right now the 40th anniversary since refugees came to the US after the Vietnam War. And those refugees did not only include uh, Vietnamese refugees, but Laotian refugees and Cambodian refugees who were intrinsically involved in the Vietnam War. And um, the secret war in both Laos and Vietnam, we don't talk about much. And that was kind of the source of wanting to start the Refugee Nation Project. Yeah, if you could scroll down to the bottom. This is our current project, Global Taxi Driver, uh, which is taxi driver stories, uh, which we're really excited about. And then these two photos here are from the Refugee Nation Project. Right now it's a three-person show. Um, it began as a two-person show. And uh, part of our inspiration was my husband, um, at the time, was my boyfriend. Uh, and <laughs> we went to Laos and visited his family. And we found that the effects of the war uh, still 10 years ago had not, and still is the case, um, was still being affected by the family who stayed in Laos. And one of the things that stayed in my mind is uh, an airstrip that went through the earth that can't be removed. And it was put down during the Vietnam War for US planes to land. Um, it can't be removed out of the earth. There's cows walking across it. Uh, we went over on a tuk-tuk and just like rattled across it because it's like it was corrugated metal looking. Um, and the other uh, sponsoring organization was organized, called Legacies of War, was organizing to remove the bombs from Laos. And those were the bombies that were dropped um, that are still embedded in the earth. And um, at that time, the Iraq war was just beginning. And so we just started this play as part of getting, you know, realizing that um, the one, you know, we do we do workshops with with youth and we, we everyone and we say show images of war and everyone shows the gun and the dead person and at the end of the workshop we say, unless there's refugees in that workshop no one ever shows a refugee and every war that has ever been there's refugees and this was what our story was about was the story of the refugees coming to the U.S. and learning how to survive. Um, and assimilating and trying to figure it out. And we um, a lot of times have performed in traditional and non-traditional venues, and it's always been hard to bring the community to the traditional venue because they never necessarily think that that's their home or where they'll go to see their story. So for example, one of our early performances was at La Pena Culture Center in Berkeley. And um, there was a Lao New Year Festival, and that's the one time of year everybody gathers. And so we went there, did an excerpt there, there were 300 Laotians there for this Lao New Year Festival, so we did an excerpt performance for them. Um, in San Pablo, just outside of Richmond, the largest Laotian community, one of the largest Laotian communities is in Richmond. Um, so we thought, you know, Berkeley, Richmond, two exits down, you know, one exit past the Costco, you can make it to Berkeley, La Pena, see our show, right? So we go out, we perform um, one of the skits, or one of the piece of scenes for this audience, um, we've never performed it for that many Laotians before, and there were things, you know, with every show, there's the understanding that people get just from telling the story, there's the understanding that people get from knowing us, and there's the understanding that people who know the inside jokes um, get. And so here we are performing as professionals, not our best, most desired performance circumstance, uh, but we had a good, luckily enough, the sound was good enough for us to hear, for them to hear us. And the elders were cracking up, standing up and applauding in places I had never had them do before. I was like, oh, I have to wait, okay, and then I'm gonna <laughs> talk. Um, and it was such a rewarding experience to be like, this audience knows exactly all of our, all, all of our references. 
Um, and then afterwards, the elders were coming up to us, oh, that was great, that was awesome, it was great. And we're like, great, we had a show at the Culture Center, you know, just down the street at, La ba at Berkeley, at um, you know, come see it. And they'd be like, oh, 10 minutes is enough. <laughs> it's like, uh. <laughs> so um, that's been our experience. It's like, how do we get this community to come and see our shows in the theater where we'd love to be able to present it, but at the same time, my most rewarding performances has been out in the community where they gather anyway. So if questions arise, why does our show look so episodic? Why does it look that way? It's because we've had to develop it for this, when we get that audience, we develop it as excerpts out at outdoor festivals, at fundraising dinners, <laughs> um, in in conferences, you know, and and then we put together the show. I love the show, but um, getting the audience there to see it is always a challenge because they're not used to seeing their own voices told on stage. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I go, uh, yeah, I think that's all. Great. Well, please go to the web page. Yeah. Thank you. humor in our show. Refugees are some of the yeah. funniest people yeah. in yeah. the yeah. world because they they use humor to survive and the jokes are like some very morbid jokes. <laughs> but it's in it's in the works. Yeah. Okay. Um well universes uh, okay well universes is uh We've been working on, we're a very political organization, so a lot of our work is very political in nature, and literally in nature. We started to, we started exploring uh, the, our play called Amerigo, we started exploring um, the fear, the history of fear in America is how we started with this political play. And in the middle of our research, um, dealing with the history of fear in America, Hurricane Katrina hit uh, New Orleans. And the, and the South Mississippi, and it was just devastating to the entire world, I actually think. And uh, we created this piece called um, Amerigo, where we talk about climate change, we talk about our responsibility to the planet, as well as to each other, and also our dependence on our government to protect us and defend us or be there when things happen, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with the hurricane was not the hurricane itself, but that we built these levees that weren't able to support it to support what we what what we needed, you know, to defend us. In addition, we create levees to in, to begin with. You know, it's like and we live in places that just, you know, you just don't allow you you want to stop nature, right? You want to stop the planet from being who it is, you know? And and so by building the levees itself and, you know, we're saying no, we're going to control this, but you just can't do it. Um, so at Maryville, we talk about all kinds of things. We talk about fracking. We talk about um, the water rise, the level, the water level rising. Um, there's just a whole slew of um, different information that we take people through. And a lot of times, we also create episodic work, right? We've always created it because that's the nature of the beast when you're creating these pieces for community. Your community has a certain attention span, <laughs> a certain amount of time that you can, you know, that they can, you know, afford and so we created it episodically as well, and when we took it to Humana Festival, we created, we constructed this entire piece. I think that the big deal for us doing the work, doing this work about Katrina, what it happened, was actually going to New Orleans, and just like you said, you have to talk to the community and, and the people. We, when we went there, um, and I really strongly believe this, there are maybe four or five people there, you call them almost like the mayors of the city, and if you talk to these four or five people you pretty much will get a, a pretty good landscape of what the community, what the city's like. So if anybody talks to you and says, well, who did you talk to? And we got the lot like, well, you guys ain't from here. Who did you talk to? Mm -hmm. you know, oh, we talked to Ms. Harrison. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are good. Um, but it was talking to folks who did go through that experience and went from being American citizens to refugees overnight. Um, and their relation to the country and how they felt neglected and um, abandoned. Um, we talked to a group of kids. This one kid, it was 
16 years old, and he described sitting on his roof for four days. Um, and to talk to a 16 year old who's been on a roof for four days, looking for somebody to come get them who never arrives. Um, for them then to be talking about the city, they can't wait to leave um, because there's nothing for them in the city. And one girl stood up and said, I'm not going anywhere. Who's gonna be here to take this over if we leave? So I'm here. And the amount of and I, it, pride that they had in that city to stay, to come back, to rebuild, um, for people to understand what levees are, what it actually did to the community, how they were abandoned. One woman described the last time she saw <coughs> her project building was on a bus as they were evacuating them. And she said she happened to look out the window as her building was going away. And when she came back, it was gone. They had tore it down. And she didn't know they were going to tear it down. Um, and having to look at her city that way. So I think. Um, and uh, taking the show on the road to different cities as a touring company um, and having them not be from New Orleans. And we were very conscious of making, because obviously the storm unearthed a lot of things. So going to different communities and having that dialogue about what it did to an American city, and we're all American citizens, and that if it happened here, where would you be? How would you react? How would you respond to your neighbor? Um, and to see the level of commitment that they have to that city. I haven't been to a city, I mean New Orleans is special within itself, but there's just a, there's a commitment and to us as artists to be able to do that and have a commitment to the work um, and to talk about these type of climate changes and things that's going on in our, on, in the world in general, but um, in the United States um, and to be able to sit there, I mean our talkbacks weren't about oh the show was great, oh it was this, how long you guys been together? It was not that. <laughs> um, especially in New Orleans, we literally kind of like sat back and it was this going on. Um, we had people, and most of the we had people getting up and walking out. And you know, you're doing hard work that happens. But then they were coming back. So I'm like, okay, I'm on stage, I'm like, okay, that woman came back. Can't be that many people in the bathroom. So you see people getting up and walking back and forth. Maybe the water images were. And it was a lot, it was, it was like traffic. And I'm like, what the hell was going on? So finally during the talk back, one of us said, so why do y'all keep getting up? And the woman said, I needed a minute. There was so much going on in here. It was bringing up so much stuff. I needed a minute. And then you hit, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I needed to get up and just breathe mm -hmm. and come back. Mm -hmm. And to have people um, like us even acknowledge their story um, and what they went through, they were very well, appreciative. The important thing, the whole message of Amaraville was really to not be isolated or not feel. Amaraville, the reason we actually, it's a village. That's the, the point of the title. It's like we're not this giant thing that is just disconnected from each other, disconnected, disconnected from the planet, disconnected from other nations. But we're this, we're all together, right? And we're all in it. And you need to start looking at it in microcosm. And just really being people from New York, right? At the time, people were like, well, why don't you write about 9-11, right? Because that's what you know. And we were like, it is what we know. We need somebody else to write about it because we can't, you know, because we're in it. Right, so no, we have not written a 9-11 play. We wrote a New Orleans, a, a Hurricane <laughs> Katrina play. Because we can see it from the outside and we can claim it and we can come as a community and say, here, we're here, we're gonna, we're gonna step in. So yeah, if, you, if you're not from New York, write a 9-11 play, you know? <laughs> because you can see it from a place that we can't. And it was about that, and, it's, and that I think a lot of the time we can't see our own planet because we're on it and we're in it. And it's about just really trying to step out of it. If there was a chance for us, like, you know, like every time you see one of these, you know, that the space shuttle flew out and all of a sudden you see the planet, you're like, oh man, what am I doing? And a lot of times, even in the play, people would be sitting there with their water bottles, right? Because, because look, they're all over us, all around us, right? And suddenly we're talking about New World water and, and you know, plastic, and they're like, trying to hide the water bottles, <laughs> you know? And, and, and it's just like, if we could just bring more and more of that, you know, activity and make people be, just to be visually present and to literally move yourself out of your world or the thing that you think you know and go to the thing you don't, don't know you know, then you won't be calling people refugees when 
they're going from New Orleans to Utah, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was really the message of America. Yeah, and, yeah, and it was, yeah. I mean, it was beautiful. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks, you guys. And I know there are many other people who have done great work in this room, and uh, we're gonna have time at the end to share. And the thing that I wanna, I wanna do a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna first move this screen up. Yeah, that's the first thing I'm gonna do. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the Cornerstone Theater Company. Hi, if anyone's in Los Angeles, their Tempest, uh, which was created with 10 communities up and down California, is closing tonight in Los Angeles. Um, it's a great show. And I wanna talk, acknowledge the work uh, of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, I'm, uh, my artistic home is both with Cornerstone Theater and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, OSF has been taking halting, but we hope ultimately successful steps in terms of uh, creating support for work around environmental questions. Um, partially, uh, we have recently commissioned Idris Goodwin to write a play about a moment of change um, in the history of Americans' relationship to its own environment. Um, we also, if anybody is interested, we have a, a, a gathering of uh, suggestions of plays from different playwrights, about 30 playwrights. We asked to say, what are your ideas for play? If anyone is interested, in hearing those thoughts from playwrights, please let me know and we will send them out and make them available to you because there are a lot of people who care about this a lot. Um, and I, what my job is for the next 20 minutes and then at 11.50 I have to go catch a cab to the airport. Um, I, wanna, I wanna capitalize on uh, the work of something called the Green Task Force, which is at OSF, which is, OSF is a very large organization and there's a group of really committed cross-departmental people, staff members, who have for the last seven years been trying to improve OSF's practices and um, artistic efforts. Um, not always entirely successfully, but always with great determination. Um, and I, you know, I think we all know that determination is really core to this kind of work. Um, but we, through our work that and through a gathering of people um, in New York last September around the climate march, we decided that that all this great work is being done by people in this room, by people not in this room. Um, but we, what we haven't done is successfully engage field-wide. We haven't created a movement. And you don't create social change without a movement. And so, hey, we're here. We've got, we're all together, so I think we ought to create a movement. Yes. So we're gonna, sure. we're gonna do some game changing. Um, <laughs> because we're mighty, we're few but mighty. Um, and so I talked to TC, so the, you know, what's, the, what's the first thing a movement needs? Web page. Um, we're not gonna really need to start though, but um, I talked to TCG, because I'm really focusing on sort of theater as, the, you know, this is the community of action, uh, and weirdly slow and broadly in taking up the, the, this work. But so TCG is gonna support um, a, a two ideas, one, um, the idea that we as both individual artists and organization can make a commitment. And we're at, gonna be asking, meaning me, you, anybody who wants to do this, a commitment. It could be this, climate change endangers life, we will help stop it. It doesn't have to be that. It can, your commitment can be do anything. Your commitment can be anything you want. But we are gonna ask, TCG will provide a place for us to stake our claim, whether it's our theater or individual artists, who are saying, yes, I'm gonna stand up and promise to do something. Um, and that's sort of the first part of the, and it's TCG, it is the page does not exist yet. If they don't do it, we'll do it again. The technology is available, but it's that place of statement. And then the second thing, of course, is what do we do? Because that's the scary part, right? And, and, but we are all collectively really smart. And the great thing is there's so much stuff going on there already, but it's very hard to find. Um, and so we're gonna create a resource page. And I'm just gonna talk about sort of what the way we've seen through all these various conversations with people about the, sort of the areas of action. Can we, does the web page need to be this? Does this list, no, this is a place to start. And all it is about sort of getting us started. So the first thing, you gotta make a commitment. Or you have to think about making a commitment. Everyone gets to decide what their own commitment is. This is mine, I think this is something the OSF Green Task Force is gonna sign off on, and we're gonna make a difference, um, and we'll see what happens, and Cornerstone Theater as well. The first thing, one of the early things too, is you have to have the conversation. I think we have all, as individual artists or institutions, 
found ourselves not sure where to have the conversation. I think we've probably all experienced that phenomenon of when you ask someone to engage, they step back because if you open that door, the implications for what you have to do are so huge. And there's so much fear around, well, I shouldn't do theater at all because theater is essentially wasteful, which of course is nonsense, but I mean, th but there is a lot of waste. That's not what we're asking. We're not asking people to deny their lives. We're asking people to engage, and the only way you can do that is by starting a conversation. And we all have to be brave, and people have to be brave in response. Um, and a lot of the conversation is, of course, how you have the conversation, and really, absolutely, as George was saying, and other people, it's a question of social justice. You can enter this conversation through science, you can enter it through the lives of your children, but you can also enter it through social justice, as we all know, and um, tell everybody to read This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein's book. Um, ways to go about it, if people are interested, this is all stuff you know, but this is just an organizational tool. Um, the content, so we can have plays that are directly about it. And we can also, um, if there are plays that are not about it, we can also, it would be great if every play that was written in the United States in the next year and produced had one line, at least one line about the environment of the characters. Because it's so interesting, so many plays you see, they don't acknowledge that there's an actual real world. And that's part of the pathology, right, that has led the climate change, the environmental movement to partial failure. It's just that we have so successfully been disassociated from our environment. And when artists create worlds that are not contextualized, then we are actually continuing the problem. So every play, one line, just one line, unless it would make the play suck, then you don't have to. But anyway, but you know, this is a, just an, another possible tool. Um, Contextualize all the work in environmental themes, following up on that. So uh, every play exists in an environment. If you are staging any play at all, it is happening in an environment. So even if it's an old existing play that you don't want to change the lines in, you can explain to your audience, you know what was happening in the world around while this play was being produced? So that we're recontextualizing everything we do in terms of the environment of the moment. Because you know, you know, uh, whether it's you know a play that's being set while um, the mining is going on, and it's not explicitly talking about mining, but it's it's behind the world, or a play like All the Way, which was produced at OSF about LBJ. Well, it's this fantastic, interesting play about he, how LBJ and others, uh, his legislative approach to trying to get the Civil Rights Bill passed. One of the things he did was give away water rights to the Colorado River, and that's how he got votes. Well, wait, you know, that's uh, something that you're not necessarily focusing on, but making sure that when those things exist in the place that you call attention to them. It's basically we have to recontextualize everything we do. Um, and then of course there's collaborating with outside organizations, building your community. Um, there is almost everywhere you look, there are huge groups of people who give an enormous shit about this. And they may be in local organizations or they may just be people and they're looking for a forum and a place to talk and people to talk to and we can do that. This is what we do really well. Um, and then I think one of the reasons it's to have moments like this is because we have to build camaraderie in ourselves um, because it's really scary, you know? And that's uh, that sort of goes to the next thing. It's scary to do the work. It's also scary to live in the world now because when you know it's scary to think about the future, but we have the opportunity to, through our, through our camaraderie and our work, to offer ourselves comfort, but also to offer our audiences comfort. Because we may change everything, and I hope we do, but the damage, there's been plenty of damage done right, and people are going to mourn. And if they don't mourn, then they despair. And if they despair, then there's no hope, right? So our job is not just to show our, offer, our, our job is also to hug during this process. And then of course there's the witnessing, you know, which is, means that we all talk about each other's work, which means we talk about the great things in the world and remind everybody else who, you know, who we work with, uh, whether as independent artists or institutions, that th this is happening in the world. Right. And then nothing more exciting, right? Like, we're not alone in this. Look at all this great, great work that's out there. And then advocacy, if you want to do what you can, go to your governor, go to, you know, the, the, turn the levers of power. Um, and that is not necessarily, there are lots of artists who don't feel that that's their job. Fine, any one of these things, 
and many more things can be done. And then, of course, there's production and logistical practice, reducing your travel, um, uh, Broadway, who is it, Broadway? The Broadway Green Alliance? Anyway, there's lots of stuff online about improving production practice, and there are a lot of very serious <coughs> production people who are doing work in theaters around. So the job, so our, my goal, I will speak for myself only, is to try to get the collective energy of our field behind this, which again, starts with a commitment and moves into structuring our, our work um, and having imagination about how, what this level of commitment, what our particular way of committing is. And I do think as we collectively encourage ourselves and other people to take this work on, you know, it's important that we not have purity tests you know, purity tests build clubs, they don't build movements. Um, and so I think probably, I would love, what time is it? Does anybody know? 11.30. 11 11.35. So um, two things, I know there are people who want to do work and, I, and there are probably people with questions and I would like to start talking about next steps because we can create some pages on the TCG website but then we all figure out how we collectively join hands, right? And maybe it's through the website. But I, you know, I think there's also something in the energy in this room and the energy of the people who are watching Hello Hell around the world um, and how we get that going. And I know there are people who are interested in doing this who just couldn't be in Cleveland today. So, sir. So I work with the Institute of Outdoor Theater and there's very little work being done in those venues on this subject where it naturally belongs. Mm -hmm. um, we track about 380 theaters around the world and there's a Google map that shows all of them website homepage. And I think there's no reason why we shouldn't say if you have a script or a pitch scenario or whatnot for a good environmental production that should be mounted outdoors, to send it to us and we'll broadcast it to the field as an opportunity. That sounds great. I would say there are also, just I forgot to write this up, there is a <coughs> Facebook page, there are a couple of Facebook pages. The one that I started, which that's why I know the name of it, <laughs> is called uh, theater Makers Against Climate Change, which is not the best title, but it was late at night and I was desperate. Um, uh, so we can, wh while we're waiting, this is a place for communication. Obviously we can communicate through, we have a knowledge of each other now through our TCG participation in this conference. This is also a Facebook page. Can I um, just do one and, other thing? I, yes, I, yes. I stumbled, and I, I stumbled this morning on a BBC news feed that I, I get daily. And it's so succinct, and it's so much even more dramatic than what's being said here that I want to read it. It's just very short. Do you want to read it? You want to stand up and read it yeah, to the yeah, camera? Please, yeah. <laughs> the Earth has entered a new period of extinction. A study by three universities has concluded, and humans could be among the first casualties. The report, led by the universities of Stanford, Princeton, and Berkeley, said vertebrates were disappearing at a rate 114 times faster than normal. These findings echo those in a report published by Duke University last year. One of the new study's authors said, we are now entering the sixth great mass extinction event. The last such event was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were wiped out, in all likelihood by a large meteor. If it is allowed to continue, life would take many millions of years to recover, and our species itself would likely disappear early on, said the lead author. Gerardo Chevalios. Yeah, the, 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 um, the so it's, it's more than frogs and bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's everyone. The sixth extinction, which just won the Pulitzer Prize by Elizabeth Colbert, is, a, is about this. Um, and uh, there, this is a partial bibliography, which I had asked to have Xerox so you could all have one. But I can send it to you because it's on my computer. It's, it's not theater books, it's books about. Um, and their website's also uh, climate. Skeptical Science is a very good website. Um, daily Climate News is a very good website. Because um, the news comes, you know, daily, daily. And the news is, yeah, difficult to um, hold, which is why we need art. <laughs> yep. To and I think we should, we should start uh, by getting everybody's email. I guess you have, you have everybody's well, TCG, email. Well, TCG knows that. TCG uh, let me okay. Let me throw out one more fact. We, uh, Phenomenon. Um, recently, a couple of things have happened, which I'm sure will not surprise you, but um, the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council, actually got in touch with the Network of Ensemble Theaters, and then at Harvard, their climate change uh, department, depart some 
subset of scientists working on climate change actually reached out to the American Repertory Theater. And, the, and I had spent some time with Anthony Leiserwitz at the Yale Climate Change Communication um, Group. And the scientists are extraordinarily aware of the fact that they, one, may not may not be the storytellers, but that the larger environmental movement has failed in creating a narrative of hope and change, a possibility. Um, and that's what we can do. And the cry has gone out to us, um, and we are gonna respond, and it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's scientists, as you heard, as you've heard, are very, very into this, but I wanna raise one really difficult question, which is funding. Um, because our experience, we had more, we had an easier time funding Another Life, which is a 9-11 play. It's about the U.S. torture program coming out of, it starts on 9-11, it goes through the U.S. torture program, and the Open Society Institutes funded it immediately. Um, but we could not get a single foundation to fund extreme weather. And the Sloan Foundation, which says that it funds plays about science, does not fund plays about climate science. It's General Motors money. It funds um, uh, Richard Lindzen at MIT, who was one of the major climate deniers in the country. It funded his chair at MIT. I, I think that the funding problem has, I mean, I'm addressing it right now uh, at risk, to say that fossil fuel pays enormous dividends, and everybody is invested in fossil fuels. And they sit on boards, and they uh, contribute to museums, and to theaters, and to da 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 and this is a real dilemma. You know, the divestment movement, which is started by the Guardian and, and picked up by the People's Climate Movement, is happening. But uh, funding is is a real problem, and I think we have to say it honestly and figure out a way to address it honestly, uh, because we're not going to get anywhere without the funding that that we need. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, just to pipe in, uh, Cleveland Public Theater did uh, a four-part. Uh, sequence called the element cycle um, and the most recent one was called fire in the water um, it was about the 1969 burning of the Cuyahoga River and all the all 12 burnings before that um, and uh, and we actually I, I want to put a fine point on uh, the collaborate community part because we ended up um, through development and the audience engagement angles we reached out to their green companies in Cleveland um, Parker Hanfin does um, uh, you know, corporation that invests a lot in uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, construction and uh, and products that are you know sustainability related. Um, re reached out to a local brewery that is uh, very much involved in local clean water uh, work. We reached out to an office chair company who supplied rolling office chairs for, for part of the pr production. So um, and then in addition to the uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District the uh, sustainability department of the city. Um, and, and so getting out of the foundation model and also getting away from arts funding, um, there are yes. you know, really creating partnerships. We had to do that too. We yeah, to um, so, yeah. Uh, and it ended up bringing in, of course, from an audience perspective, brought in uh, a very, very diverse audience. Um, one of the most impactful moments was uh, a woman who works for the Cleveland Metro Parks um, coming up after the show and saying, it's so refreshing that other people are talking about this. You know, to see a cast, a multi-generational cast, including young artists who weren't even around, um, who don't even, weren't even around for the origins of the environmental movement, um, uh, you know, talking uh, in an educated way about climate issues was, was really exciting. So, um, but yes, the partnership collaboration thing, finding the people that want these conversations to happen and do not have the tools. my position at the National Theatre Project, there's been a number of projects that have gotten funding, um, but they are for devised and ensemble work. Right. And um, right now, I think maybe, maybe the last performance, uh, Mondo Pizarro is finishing up their Cry You Won uh, project, and, and it's in, right now it's in New Haven, Connecticut, and it is actually on a reservoir. Um, and those kinds of projects, um, you know, we look to fund those kinds of projects, not just for the environmental stipends, but where there is a real working with the community and bringing the community in. And I think, um, aside from our funding, the 
most successful projects in that sense are those that involve community because the community supports you in totally different ways. They also did this in Vermont with uh, Sandlass Puppet Theater mm -hmm. as their host. And that took enormous community resources, <coughs> way beyond any monetary funding that they ever received. Mm -hmm. um, and that is often, I think, for some of the most successful shows, the only way to get it done. Yeah. Our Extreme Weather was funded by individuals who came up the front. You know, we had groups coming, uh, buying benefit evenings. You know, so although it's a written play with actors, it involved also community in that, in that way, and that was how we got funded. I don't think, I don't think a three-mile procession can happen without community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> change of public policy. Yeah, there has to be public policy. In order for there to be a major, major, major change. It's like the Depression, you know? The Depression was only uh, solved because the government got involved and started funding the arts, literally, you know, all, the, all over the place. So uh, uh, the government has to, has, to, has to step in. And the world governments, and this is what COP21 in yeah. the UN is involved with, yeah. I'll just mention in terms of public policy, I'm in the National Public Administration Program at the University of Georgia. Um, and so we were, one of my classes talked about co-production and just in different public and private sector. And some of the research that we looked at was environmental public policy. There's not a lot of research on it in general and how co-production is done. Um, luckily co-production <laughs> is starting to be more of a, a precedent in research itself. So I mean, I think it is just going to mm -hmm. take a while. But you know, with us, UGA in particular is being one of the leading um, research organizations within public policy, public administration. But there was little to no, you know, research that has been done yeah. on co-production in environmental public policy and how that can kind of impact. But I think with the, the younger leaders coming in, we are trying to do more research on that. Um, I'm going to just step in because I have to go get on a plane um, and thank everybody who's here. And in terms, I'll watch the end of it on HowlRound. So I'll see what I <laughs> uh, don't talk about me behind my back. Um, but uh, you know, what we have, we have a structure and we have so many great people. And I, I, I encourage you all to talk about the work you're already doing for those who haven't had a chance to speak. Um, but our next step is figure out how to inspire and require our compatriots. Um, and so as we all go home and think about the best ways to do that, and then we will collectively assign tasks, or you do that after I'm gone, um, and we'll get it done, because it's too important not to. And it's really great to be in the room with you guys. I really appreciate it. So, bye. I'm gonna go expand my carbon footprint. <laughs> well, we took the train, and it took 12 hours from New York to Cleveland. There's no infrastructure in this country for non-carbon intensive travel, yeah, right? Yeah. That's another problem. I mean, this is a public policy issue. We have a Congress that is blocking every meaningful climate uh, piece of legislation, and there haven't even been that many, you know, um, uh, and has blocked it for, you know, many, many years. And we cannot solve this without public policy in the public interest. We, we must change public policy, and, and culture can help do that, obviously, but it's a big, you know, we have to, yeah. So, well, the I, 10 minutes around, let's go around. I just want to um, say as uh, something, I know we talk about how to get funding, how to get, you know, I mean, it's such a difficult um, thing to do, yeah. but we are at a theater conference. And one of the things that I don't see is us putting our regional theater to task mm -hmm. on actually commissioning works that talk about the environment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate that the Humana Festival, Mark Masterson commissioned a Maryville, mm -hmm. and that Allison at OSF is commissioning, you know, through the American mm -hmm. Revolution Theater History Cycle, they're commissioning a play. But what other theaters are making it their business mm -hmm. 
right. to actually commission new work or to produce works, works that are continuously. Already. You know, just like mm -hmm. we say, yeah. we want to diversify theater. We want to make sure that there are places of color. There are places, you know, that we're. There has to be a place for mm -hmm. this kind of work, mm -hmm. where in your season you have to have this play. You have to have a play like this, and you have to play have a play like this, and you have to talk about this. So. It, since we're here, right, mm -hmm. wouldn't it make sense for us to really try to Absolutely. create Absolutely. even an advocacy group mm -hmm. among the regional theaters and the people who actually... I was could, told by you know, someone who will be nameless theaters. who runs right. a very big theater, well, I already did one climate change play, Yeah. right, as if that's the end of that. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, have you heard of Arts Earth Partnership? So they're an organization in Los Angeles. Um, they started the uh, Electric Lodge, which is based in Venice, California, mm -hmm. and it is completely solar powered except for the light board and the light system. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was create an organization to now teach the other performance venues and cultural centers in Los Angeles how to be green. Mm -hmm. So they actually got some big funding to go around and do that. So I mean, I, I'll put it on the 2.0 mm -hmm. list and you can find out what they're doing. Um, but it's pretty impressive. They're like mm -hmm. really, I mean, it's not just what you put on stage, but what is your practice in the, in the <coughs> that you're in, yeah. Um, I just wanted to share a quick anecdote um, also related to this Fire in the Water project. In partnership with the um, Office of Sustainability, we had, um, it was the year of clean water here in Cleveland, there, it's the celebration year, um, and this, play happened inside of that, so one of the features was that there was this big banner that at all the organizations um, where there was some sort of water-related event, there was a big banner that said, what, um, what clean water means to me is dot, 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 and there were markers and audience members could, could sign this. So these banners were out at the zoo and the you know, beach cleanups and everything. We were the only arts organization that was hosting a clean water event. Um, <clears throat> and afterwards, at, at a meeting uh, with the Office of Sustainability, um, I, I found out that the, the CPT banner was sort of, had been sort of rolled up and put in corners like, no, we can't display that one um, because there's sort of inappropriate language on it. And all of us at this committee were like, whoa, let's see it. So um, we rolled it out and it was interesting because it was filled with color people had drawn, you know, and they'd come out of this exciting uh, play and, um, and there were some critical questions um, in response to what, what clean water means to me. And there was one that said something along the lines of, you know, um, the city is really proud of X, Y, and Z, but we still have so much far, you know, so much further to go. And, um, and then in this area, this area, and this area. And, but there was, and there was some, you know, some slight light profanity, you know, like a <laughs> dam or a hail or something like that. Um, and, uh, and all of us in the room said, oh, this, this is good. Like this is like this is what yeah. this is what art provokes, yeah. guys. Yeah. Like this, and and it was interesting because that's the, and I, there's something about um, that Allison raised about the sort of hope change conversation, and how we need the critique, and I feel like that's what the arts can bring to the environmental movement, is you know, and I think there are parallels to you know, um, I, I'm drawing a parallel you know between this and, uh, and sexual health training with kids. Like if we talk about the bad stuff, if we talk about like, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna know these, they're gonna know about these things. If we are critical of our, poli you know, if we're critical of our policies, if we're critical of environmentalism, like <gasps> it's gonna puncture the movement. But no, it's actually, people need to feel like they can authentically express their, um, their, their critiques um, and, uh, and sort of harsher, harsher feelings. And I think that authentic engagement is something we can really bring and I think our art can also, um, you know, we don't want to always be sanctimonious about these issues. You know, that, that hope and change needs to be grounded in um, the reality and the, the darkness um, as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and the other thing is that <laughs> I, I think quite a few people mentioned this uh, already today, but you have to use comedy, you know, you have to use fantasy, you have to use, uh, uh, in the play about uh, torture that we did, we used surreal, surreal reality and reality, surreal reality and reality, and we kept switching back and forth, and we found the audience loved that. And also, in and because it gives them a space to look at it yeah. with you, and to, and to get the critical 
view of something and say, yeah, why shouldn't we criticize? Why shouldn't we? Because that's the beginning of change, okay? And, you know, it's very important to use every tool uh, that you can, that you see in any other form of entertainment that is also and becomes a viable tool in a place about social change. It's so important. You know, and Brecht was the first one to say, uh, I, I always make sure that it's entertaining. Yeah, well, I mean, what's so you moving know? about this group is that the commitment to art is so clear. We're all doing yeah. political art, art, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so it's not really a problem. And we have strategies and we change styles and we, you know, we have all of our artistic practice that we're constantly, that's our most important, that's what we do. Um, there is enormous pressure. What the antidote that you described is pressure from on top. Who made the phone call to who, to who took that banner down because of what the art provoked? And, and this, is, this we have to recognize as well. The, the pressure is coming from, from the top, and we're gonna see this as we move towards the COP21 in, in Paris. What the US sabotaged Copenhagen, right? Um, the Copenhagen UN Congress resulted resulted in nothing. Everybody says COP21 is the last chance, the last best chance to put a cap on carbon emissions so that the temperature doesn't rise over two degrees Celsius in the next 30 years. If it goes over two degrees Celsius in the next 30 years, we will see catastrophic uh, um, disasters, more so than we're going to see. The, the ice in the Arctic is melting faster than it ever has. The ice in the Antarctic is doing the same thing. This is the hottest year on record already, 2015. We have already committed ourselves to climate change. It can be slowed down, and it can only be slowed down through public policy in the public interest. We have to put enormous pressure, and I'm not just talking about advocacy also, but I'm talking about the arts, all of the things we do. But we have to recognize that this pressure is coming from Congress, and they are, and it's documented. They are, the Republican climate deniers in Congress are funded by the fossil fuel industry. They are there because of the fossil fuel industry. And this is all documented, I'm not making it up, and this is what's going on. And somehow, we have to recognize that and not, not stop working because of it, but work harder because of it, but know what's going on. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture. Five minutes. Five um, minutes. You have I, I just wanna speak to um, the hope and despair um, issue, because I know I find myself in despair around a lot of things that come up in, in the news and things that people are saying and the things that I've learned. And in my work in the theater, one of the things I've been trying to cultivate is a sort of higher spirit and a place of hope and a place that we can come together in order to manifest the results. I think it's really critical because a lot of my work has taken a very environmental activist kind of, come on people, let's get together and get it, get it together. And I've been doing that for so many years and yet I see it you know, it's all just kind of unraveling through, I, I, can't, I can't pull it back. Mm -hmm. And so it's, to me, it's about, you have to kind of surrender to this place of despair in order to kind of move on through to the other side so that we can transform and we can manifest and that there's this piece around it that's also about solidarity in working with other people who really want to affect change and putting that hope and that spirit into the work I think is really critical because I really don't want people to walk out of the theater going, there's no hope, it's the end. <laughs> and then they won't even do anything. So there's this cultivation of, not only is this really important work and really vital and really must happen, but we've also kind of kind of lift each other up in it, or we're gonna just fall down and cry right. and not do anything. <laughs> and, and, and that's the piece that I've been working around, around spirit. Mm -hmm because if we can kind of uplift the human spirit around that coming together, there's some, some possibilities mm -hmm. that can happen. Absolutely, what? absolutely. Beauty, beauty is, and spirit is the, is the essence, and you can hear it in the Pope's encyclical, the beautiful language he picked up from St. Francis, um, our sister Mother Earth, right? Um, uh, Extreme weather ends with two possible epilogues, and one is the disaster epilogue, and the other is when we wake up, and then light comes back, the sun comes back, the birds come back, the wind blows, and, it, and it's a simple matter. 
of waking up, literally, and it's a spiritual awakening. Well, I think it is we also, as, as honest theater people, have to accept that the other alternative is possible. It's possible. Yes. Yeah, the end of the species is possible. Mm -hmm. What yes. play do we write about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's One of the most possible. effective nuclear books that was ever written was On the Beach by Neville Shue. Mm -hmm. Talk about a depressing mm -hmm. book. But those who read it said this became so real yeah. through a book that it gave impetus but to, to change this is the back and Tragedy is a real story. This is too. the back and forth pull, and every tragedy has beauty in it, and yes. that's what the, the, the Bach Island is a great optimistic. ecological play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there, there is no tragedy without uh, the beauty of nature. So it's always it's always a balance and it's always a pull. And I, I totally agree with both of you, if I may say, you're both, both absolutely same, right. right. Yeah. You're both absolutely right, but that's what art is. Art contains the ambiguities. Art is large enough. A theater piece that is a good theater piece contains both possibilities within it. I think there's a beauty in the possibility of humanity expansion. Mm -hmm. And I think that that conversation is very important. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, us thinking that we are so, so important to this planet, that the planet can't live without us, beyond us, you know, is a very real conversation. And yeah. sometimes I'm like, you know what, maybe we have to go. And something new has got to happen because we obviously can't get this together. And, and it may be a morbid kind of way, of, <laughs> I'm not really sure what kind of way that is of thinking, but sometimes I do think about that. And I'm like, you know, the, the planet has cleansed itself before. And um, this is really a conversation of our, personal survival as a species, and, and how do we have other species survive, but there is also an, an evolving possibility that beyond the cleansing of the planet, the new species will The only so thing I want to add to that, though, the deep ecologists ask this question, what are we here for, because we're just destructive, exactly, yeah. and answered it with, we are the storytellers of the universe. Mm -hmm. We tell the story of the universe. And and I do think that's a valid thing that we do, <laughs> that yeah. we do. So it's the and that the universe way. enjoys <laughs> it. Right? So let's leave behind some good plays. Yeah, let's leave behind some good plays. I was just going to also expand in terms of funding that I'm a part of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And so it's a historically African American sorority, which is part of the Divine Nine, which is nine historically African American fraternities and sororities. And so we do have in budgets that we have national initiatives that we have to do. Um, to program and implement. So Delta in general has local chapters and states and we have international chapters and we have funding to be able to support initiatives. So I'm an arts and letters chair for my local chapter and so I have to program and have a budget based on plays but then also we have Delta Research and Educational Foundation so that's a foundation that can give and we have partnerships. Um, this year we work with 14, 13 national organizations to provide funding with and work with these organizations. So I definitely say, like, let's think about organizations who have these national initiatives mm -hmm. that where funding is available. My dues, the dues that I pay every year, needs to go to something. <laughs> 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 um, and so I would like to see. <laughs> Keep the good work going. Yes. <laughs>